Hi everyone, today we're going to talk about um, protected, threatened, and endangered species of Nebraska. Um, so to start off, we're just going to go over what um, certain things mean before we get into um, the actual species. So first of all, protected species are species of animals or plants which are forbidden to by the law to harm or destroy. Um, threatened species is a species of animal or plant in which it is forbidden by law to harm or destroy. Um, and then the endangered species, an endangered species is a species that is very likely to become extinct in the, in the near future, either worldwide or in a particular political jurisdiction. Endangered species may be at risk due to the factors such as habitat loss, poaching, and invasive species. And then flora is the plants, um, plants, bacterial, or fungal life, um, and such, such life's characteristics of a region, period, or specific environment. Uh, and then fauna are the animals um, of a particular region, habitat, or geological period. And before we get started, just um, globally, the number of endangered species is rising. You can see this chart from 2007 to 2019 shows that there's been an increase each year of um, endangered species. Uh, and they go into mammals, reptiles, birds, insects, amphibians, uh, fish, and others, which would be like macroinvertebrates uh, and crustaceans and corals. So. Um, yeah, they've all rose pretty um, significantly since just 2007. Um, so for the threatened species of Nebraska, we're going to first talk about threatened flora, which are the plants again. Um, so the first one would be the western fringed orchid. So there has been declines in the orchid populations in Nebraska um, have, been have been primarily caused by conversion of native grasslands to cropland. So overgrazing, annual haying, exotic plant invasion, especially cool season grasses and leafy um, developments and herbicide and spraying are also threats. As a prairie species, the orchid uh, evolved with grazing by um, native herbivores. Uh, and although orchids exist on moderately grazed grasslands, they can't they can't to tolerate heavy grazing for extended periods of time. Additionally, since the western prairie fringed orchid is so reliant on um, sphinx moths for pollination and seed production, any threat to the sphinx moths, um, such as the use of insecticides, is a threat to the orchid. Loss of the important native pollinators may be impacting pollination and gene flow to the species. Um, and the Western prairie fringed orchid is um, both federal, federally and state um, listed as a threatened species and uh, is protected um, from removal or destroying. Uh, and then there's the Ute Lady Tresses. Um, they were first found in Nebraska in 1996. The first survey for the species completed in 1997. Um, they, were lo they located approximately 2,300 plants. They were and still are found in only private land along the two mile stretch of the Niobrara River Valley. In 2010, another survey was completed, which found only 831 flowering plants. Nationwide, there are only about six, uh, 60,000 individual plants. Um, habitat loss and degradation um, are the primary cause for the threatened. Um, Ute lady tresses, um, groundwater irrigation for crops is also a threat to the ute lady tresses because they lower the water table and disturb the naturally um, natural hydrology in the upper Niagara River Valley. Uh, additionally, invasive plant species are coming are competing with the native flora, including the orchid. The primary invasive species of concern are garrison creeping foxtail and quack grass, both cool season grasses. Also late summer, August to September, haying uh, not only damages the plant but also coincides with the flowering period, thus the seeds are not allowed to develop. 
And then the lady tresses do not flower every year and sometimes remain dormant for multiple years, further adding to the natural resource manager's inability properly to document their location because they're not always out and flowered. Um, and then they were declared federally listed threatened species in January of 1992. And they're also listed as a Nebraska threatened um, species. And then uh, we have the American ginseng. Um, although the Amer American ginseng occurs over a relatively large range, there are likely um, millions and even billions of indiv individual plants in the wild. The total population has declined, declined dramatically since European settlers first began settling in the eastern United States. Commercial harvest of ginseng root began in the 1700s. Uh, originally used by Native Americans for med medicinal purposes. Today it's primarily used for uh, in China and Hong Kong. Commercial harvests for the plants continue today as their root is considered by some of the great uh, by some to be of great medicinal value. It is especially coveted in China where one pound of the root can bring several and be several hundreds of dollars. The total value of the commercial harvest of wild ginseng in the United States is estimated about 27 million per year with the, most of it being shipped to China and Hong Kong. American ginseng is not listed on the federal threatened and endangered species list, but it is still regulated through other laws, including um, the Convention on Ina International Trade in Endangered Species of Wildlife, Fauna and Flora. Um, which bans the international trade of American ginseng in the whole plant, live or dead form, uh, and whole or parts of the root. Harvest of the wild American ginseng is regulated by the, um, the United States Fish and Wildlife Service, which has approved the harvest in 19 states within 18 of the um, of, this, of these states harvested plants must be at least five years old and have at least three leaves. In Illinois, plants must be at least 10 years old and have four leaves. Additionally, all 19 states have harvested harvest seasons which start in September. In Nebraska, American ginseng is listed as a threatened species um, of wild plants and is not allowed at any, um, and harvest of it is not allowed at any age if commercially grown plants can be harvested at any time. And then the last one would be the small white lady slipper. So um, it is a species of tall grass prairie um, and has experienced a similar fate to the rest of the uh, prairies of Northern America, a nearly 95% decline. It is believed that before prairie conversion, slippers were relatively common species. The biggest threats to the small weight lady slipper include conversion of prairie habitat um, for crop production and urban development. Additionally, livestock grazing has shown to have dire consequences for the species. Although some grazing by wildlife has been documented, it is um, not proven to be detrimental to the species. Other concerns include accidental herbicide spraying out of competition from sod farm forming um, non-native species and shading by woody vegetation. And then small white lady slipper is listed as uh, threatened in the Nebraska, but is not federally listed as um, threatened. So it's um, just in Nebraska that so far that we know of um, that has um, labeled it threatened. So then we'll move to threatened fauna. So there's a couple different categories when you get into fauna, um, just different categories of um, animals. So the first category would be birds. Um, so to start off, there's the piping plover, which is the one pictured. Um, since the early 1900s, habitat loss and destruction from channelization, irrigation, and the construction of reservoirs on our nation's largest river systems, such as the Platte River and the Missouri River, um, make up the primary reason for the piping plover pop population decline. The piping plover was listed as a federally threatened species in 1986, and it is currently and fed um, currently state and federally protected. Um, because there has been continued loss for su suitable uh, river sandbar habitat and increased availability of sand pit habitat, many piping plovers have tr transitioned from using sandbar habitat to sand pit habitat over. Um, 
much of their range in Nebraska. Today, piping plovers are still facing threats of human disturbance, continued habitat loss, pollution, and contaminants on their breeding and wintering grounds, disease, and yeah. Uh, and then the next one would be ruffer red knot. Uh, although the overall species of ruffer red knot is not listed as a species of concern by the International Union of Conservation of Nature, um, the red list, the ruffa subspecies is federally listed as a threatened species. The red knot once migrated through the United States in huge flocks. Although flocks provide safety from predators, they also put the species at an increased risk for habitat destruction. For example, all individuals of a species pass through the specific location in one large group. All individuals are then increased risk for being impacted by weather, system, pollution, and overhunting. Um, populations of the red knot declined in the 1800s due to unregulated hunting. The Ruffa red knot has continued to decline since the 1960s with a more rapid decline happening in the 2000s. This decline is likely due to their dependence on the Delaware Bay as part of their migration and their feeding on horseshoe crab eggs to gain, um, right gain weight during migration. Human harvesting of the horseshoe crab along the entire Atlantic close coast has significantly declined their critical food source. Um, climate change is also presenting the red rough, the rough of red knot with challenges. It has been noted that the arrival of the rough of red knot at the Delaware Bay has changed slightly. This has large implications of, for the availability of its food sources. Furthermore, the Arctic tundra where their nesting is changing due to changes in temperature and the quality of shoreline habitat is also likely to change due to um, rising sea levels. Then there's the Macau's long spur, and then there's the mountain plover. Um, estimate, estimates of the mountain plover population size ranges from um, 12,500 to uh, 28,000 individuals across their current range. The U.S. Wild Fish and Wildlife Service designated the mountain plover as a candidate species under the U.S. Endangered Species Act, and then subsequently proposed for the listing of a threatened species. After the review of literature and studies, it is determined that the status um, of federally threatened under the ESA was not warranted, so they didn't get the federally threatened um, for the mountain plover. But in Nebraska, the mountain plover is um, classified as Threatened. The mountain plover is listed as a threatened species also in Mexico and endangered species in Canada. So then we'll move on to mammals, starting with the river otter. Unre unregulated trapping and habitat alteration were probably the most important factors uh, leading to the complete disappearance of otters from Nebraska. The river otter once was native to Nebraska and was commonly reported in journals of early explorers. Since otters were highly prized, for their thick, luxuri luxurious pel pelts. Fur trappers targeted both river otters and beavers. Um, a harvest record indicated that some 65,000 otters were taken in North America in 1800 alone. The conversion of prairie and wetlands to agriculture reduced available habitat for them as well. Um, by 1904, numbers across the country had dipped to about 4,500. Um, about this time, the river otter disappeared from Nebraska. It was not until 1977 that the otter was found again in Nebraska after being inadvertently trapped near the Republic River, Republican River. Uh, in 1986, the river otter was listed as an endangered species in Nebraska soon after the Na uh, Nebraska Game and Parks Commission began a reintroduction program releasing 159 otters between 1986 to 1991. Today, the river otter populations in Nebraska are growing again. In January 2020, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission voted to remove river otters from the state threatens list on recommendations from staff biologists. So this is actually a really good example of um, reintroducing a species in where they were once native. Um, and then there has been success with growing numbers for them. Then our next um, species uh, mammal would be the southern flying squirrel. The primary reason the southern flying squirrel is threatened in Nebraska 
is the limited amount of mature hardwood um, forest habitat. Um, hardwood trees such as oaks and hickories produce acorns and nuts that squirrels require in large quantities to survive over the winter. Mature trees are also needed to provide the cavities or holes that squirrels need for nesting and protection. After the area was settled, many of the large trees were cut for lumber. Timber harvest still occurs periodically as trees reach mature size. The harvest removes trees that produce acorns and nuts that provide the greater number of cavities. The southern fire flying squirrel is listed as a Nebraska's threatened species. Um, and they are um, not listed federally. Then our last mammal for threatened um, would be the northern long-eared bat. The population status of the northern long-eared bat is bleak. In 2006, a new disease, white nose syndrome, was first detected um, in New York. Since, there, since the disease has been transferred from bat to bat and rapidly spread from New York across um, much of the eastern United States, with the spread of the white nose syndrome, the population of some populations of northern long-eared bat has declined by 99%. Other causes of population decline are due to extensive logging and tree thinning of their forested habitat, human disturbance while hibernating, and mortality from wind farms. Um, additionally, human activities have caused changes in their um, cave climate, which affects the bats hibernating. That's, um, that said, the population of the northern eared bats would likely have been sustainable if there were not the introduction of the white nose, uh, white nose syndrome disease. Um, so that would be the all for the mammals. And then we'll be moving on to fish. fish. So there is the lake sturgeon fish that, um, was listed federally in um, as either threatened or endangered by 19 of 20 states within the original range of the United States. In Nebraska, is it's listed as a threatened species. Today, much like uh, much of the Missouri River upstream of Gavin's Point Dam is lake-like with no moving water. In an overabundance of non-native fish combined with changes in river flow and water quality have played a role in the decline of the lake sturgeon population. These changes are also directly affected, have affected the resource base, um, resource food base. These fish depend on um, for all life stages. Adding to the problem of habitat decline is their poor reproductive um, success and little or no recruitment of wild juveniles to the adult population. The fish that are um, reproductively mature today were all spawned before construction of dam systems and they are, are thought to be nearing the end of their lifespan. And it is speculated that a single sturgeon at spawning time is already having a hard time finding a mate. Uh, then there's the northern red-bellied dace and the fish scale dace. Although they are considered a secure species in most of its range, both the spins, the fit, fine scale and northern red-bellied dace are considered threatened in several states, including Nebraska. They were added to the Nebraska's threatened species list in 1976. They are not listed as a federal threatened or endangered species. Then we'll move to reptiles. Um, so for reptiles, there is the timber rattlesnake and then the western masuga. Uh, the biggest threat to the species is habitat loss. Habitat loss results from practices such as conversion of grasslands and wet meadows to cropland, draining, the marsh draining of marsh habitat and flooding from the construction of ponds and lakes. These actions result in the reduction of or elimination in crayfish and their burrows. Some small man-made lakes can provide proper habitat for crayfish and then and thus masuga rattlesnakes um, along shorelines and backwaters. So then we're going to go into the endangered species of Nebraska, starting off with the flora again. Um, there's only three endangered um, species of flora in Nebraska, and the first would be the blown, blowout pens, pensamen. Um, 
They were thought to be extinct by 1940, but they were later rediscovered in 1968 at the time of federal listing. Blow, um, they, were, they were known to exist in only in six population centers of four counties in Nebraska, in the Nebraska Sandhills. Um, approximately 7,000 plants occurred on less than 25 total acres scattered throughout the Sandhills. Improved range management practices, which promote blowout healing, were a major cause of the species decline in Nebraska, and it's still the case today. The Nebraska Game and Parks Commission listed blowout penstemon on as a federally endangered species in 1986. The species was listed as um, federally endangered in 1987. Then there's the Colorado butterfly plant. Um, and uh, there are only 14 small populations of the Colorado butterfly uh, plant ex that's existing in the wild. These sites are often um, degraded, leading to poor plant conditions within these four Teen populations. It is estimated that only 3,000 individual plants remain. Because this species has relatively small range, extremely specific habitat requirements, it's unlikely the species will survive without better land management. And then lastly, there will be the saltwort. Habitat destruction and degradation are major threats to the saltwort since settlement. There's more than 90% of Nebraska's saline wetlands um, have been destroyed or highly degraded through, drain, um, through drainage or filling for agriculture, commercial, and residential development. Increased freshwater runoff into the wetlands from the developments in decreases the salinity levels of these um, habitats, allowing non-salt tolerant plants to invade. Saltwort requires highly um, sal saline soils and cannot survive in freshwater wetlands or with competition with freshwater plants. Although saltwort is not federally threatened or endangered species, it is listed as a Nebraska endangered species. And then we have our endangered fauna in Nebraska. So we would start with birds again. Um, the Eskimo cruel, um, in the mid 1800s, enormous flocks of Eskimo cruels um, could be seen migrating across the prairies of, of the central United States. Once uh, one recorded indicates, one record indicates that a single flock of Eskimo cruels in Nebraska covered 40 to 50 acres. Um, between 1870 and 1890, unregulated hunting dramatically reduced the numbers of Eskimo cruels. Its, its behavior of traveling in large flocks and and it's an apparent lack of fear of humans made the bird an easy target. Um, although hunting is, uh, of non-game birds became legal in 1917 due to the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, the population of Eskimo cruel was unable to recover. It's likely that conversion of therapy of prairies into cropland both in wintering grounds in South America as well as across the migration path in central United States contributed to the species lack of recovery. The last known Eskimo cruel was seen and shot on, in, on Barbados in 1963. The specimen is now on display at the Philadelphia Music, uh, Museum of Natural History. There was one confirmed sighting in 1981 in Texas, but all other reports since have been unconfirmed. The Eskimo cruel was officially placed on the endangered species list in 1967. And that is the bird that is pictured above. And then we have the whooping crane. Um, while several factors have contributed to the current status of whooping cranes, the primary reasons um, are habitat loss and past rampant unregulated hunting for their meat and feathers. Whooping cranes live in wetlands, and the success of whooping cranes population depend on the health uh, of wetlands and ecosystems over time. Wetlands across North America have been drained for agriculture and damaged through development, oil, gas, and gas exploration, and the construction of intercoastal waterways. Whooping cranes have also been hunted both for their meat and pl plumage. The long beautiful feathers were fashionable adornments to hats and clothing. Humans have 
also robbed crane nests because collectors pay high price for rare eggs. And while shooting the endangered cranes is now against the law, the bodies of whooping cranes are occasionally discovered after being shot. Since humans contributed to the decline of the whooping crane, many people now feel there we have a moral duty to help this magnificent bird. Our natural heritage of biological diversity, all of the species of and plants of animals, is a precious resource. Our future quality of life depends on how we take care of our nat natural inheritance. Um, the whooping crane you will actually see in Nebraska, not as much as you see a sandhill crane. There's going to be much more sandhill cranes, but you'll notice a whooping crane um, because they're going to be at least two feet taller than a sandhill crane, and they're going to be like white, um, while sandhill cranes have um, more of a brown color. And then our last bird is interior tern. Historically, least terns were hunted in the 1800s for the commercial use of its feathers and to decorate ladies' hats. After the signing of a, a, 1918 Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which prohibited the sale, purchase, taking, or possession of any wild migratory bird or bird parts, just feathers, commercial harvesting became illegal and the species population began to increase throughout the 1940s. However, human development, habitat alteration, and habitat destruction in the form of river channelization and reservoir construction subsequently led to another rapid population decline. By the mid-1970s, uh, least turns population had decreased by more than 80% from the 1940s. The interior least tern was federally listed as endangered in 1985. Today, interior least terns are still facing threats, continued um, habitat loss, human disturbance, pollution, and disease. And then we'll go into mammals. Um, the first one would be the black-footed ferret. Um, so the black-footed ferret you will not find in Nebraska today but there are historical records of the species in Nebraska, but um, there are no recent records of them in Nebraska. While the use of the prairie dog burrows provided the black-footed ferret refuge in the past, it also helped lead to its decline. Prairie dogs and their towns are often seen as nuisances to rangers and landowners. The holes created by prairie dogs were believed to be a threat to wandering livestock, Additionally, prairie dogs eat grass and thus can be viewed as compet um, competitor competitors of cattle and rangeland. Because of all of this, prairie dogs have been killed in large numbers. Human destruction of habitat addition, in addition to extensive disease among prairie dogs have caused populations of prairie dogs to plummet because black-footed ferrets rely heavily on prairie dog communities for both habitat and food. The plummet of prairie dog numbers has also led to the fall of the black-footed ferret. Conversion of open prairies and cropland have further impacted both black-footed ferret, ferrets and prairie dogs. Additionally, black-footed par ferrets uh, have been widely, widely impacted by diseases such as the Slovakic plague. Um, once numbering in the tens of thousands across their range, the black-footed ferret was officially listed federally endangered species in March of 1967 and it was believed to, to become extinct by the late 1970s. However, a small population was discovered in Wyoming in 1981. This small population was reduced further by disease. By, by 1986, only 18 individuals remained. The 18 individuals were captured and formed the basis for breeding and reintroduction efforts that are being continued today. And then next we have the gray wolf, which there are recent records of the gray wolf in Nebraska. There are not historical records of the species in Nebraska. Um, and uh, once a critical keen, they were once a critical keystone predator species that was found in a wide variety of habitats across the United States. Gray wolf po populations declined rapidly in the 1800s due to high prices for hides. Government-sponsored predator control programs, poisoning, and loss of habitat. By the early 1900s, most populations of gray wolves were uh, near extinction. 
The gray wolf was added to the federal endangered species list in 1978, except in Minnesota, where it's listed as threatened. In 2001, the Idaho and Montana populations were delisted due to the conservation efforts and population recovery. In 2017, the Northern Rockies population in Idaho, Montana, Eastern Washington, and Eastern Oregon and Wyoming was delisted due to population recovery. In Nebraska, the gray wolf is listed both as federally and state endangered species list. Although no gray wolves are found in Nebraska, the state was part of the species historic range. Additionally, the habitat in Nebraska could support the wolves. There are currently four just distinct populations of gray wolves, Western Great Lakes, Northern Rocky Mountains, Southern Recovery Area, and Alaska. The, popula the total population of the gray wolf is approximately 13,380 to 16,880 individuals. And then our last mammal for endangered would be the swift fox. The major reason that for the decline of the swift fox is habitat destruction and eradication uh, for efforts for predators. With the increase in agriculture in the Great Plains came a significant decrease in short grass prairie habitat. Uh, this in turn led to a decrease in prairie dog towns. With no prairie dogs, swift foxes lost a major prey species. Additionally, these dogs, um, additionally these prairie dogs burrows provide a safe space for swift foxes to escape predators such as hawks, eagles, coyotes, and humans. Additionally, swift, swift foxes may be killed by control methods aimed at coyotes, such as poisoning and trapping. It should be noted, however, that because coyotes are a major predator swift, of swift foxes, a reduction in coyote numbers can be beneficial to swift foxes. So just like the black-footed ferret, the decline of prairie dogs has affected the swift fox um, as well. And then uh, there is the mussels, which there is only one uh, endangered mussel in Nebraska. Due to their sedentary lifestyle and their lack of mobility, um, the scale, the population of the scale shale mussels is highly impacted by water quality. If water quality deteriorates, the mussels are not able to move rapidly and escape poor conditions. Issues impacting water quality um, include increased sedimentation, changes in water temperature, and changing in water flow patterns. Each of these issues can be caused by human actions, including dam construction, poor land management, and increased runoff. Water quality may also deteriorate due to chemical um, pesticide, herbicide, factory, and urban discharge or runoff. Uh, additionally, the scale shell muscle can be greatly impacted by invasive species such as zebra mussel, which can all attach to the scale cell mussel and suffocate it. Although once found in streams and rivers throughout much of the eastern United States, the scale cell mussel has seen 75% reduction in the number of streams where it is. Um, and then lastly, for our endangered fauna, we have insects and then more fish. So for the insects, um, one of the biggest um, ones that is endangered in Nebraska would be the American burying beetle. Reports of the decline in population numbers were first recorded as early as the 1880s. Um, by the mid 1920s, the American burying beetle was nearly limited from areas east of the Appalachian Mountains. The decline west of the Appalachian Mountains occurred later. Uh, originally found in 35 states and Canada, the beetle is now only found in Nebraska, Rhode Island, Oklahoma, South Dakota, Kansas, and Arkansas. In 1988, it was listed as a candidate species on the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Endangered Species List, and it was officially listed as an endangered species in August 1989, and some reintroduction efforts have been attempted in Ohio and Massachusetts with limited success. And if they're found in Nebraska, uh, you're supposed to um, take survey of it and then turn it into Nebraska Game and Parks. They monitor um, the population pretty heavily. And then the Salt Creek Tiger Beetle. In 2012, University of Nebraska Lincoln researchers counted 374 adult Salt Creek Tiger Beetles, the most beetles counted since 1991 
when intensive surveys began um, was 777 individuals in 2002. The fewer beetles counted was, uh, the fewest beetles counted were 153 in 2005. All of the beetles were confined to just three areas north of Lincoln. There were six different beetle populations in 1991. Populations at, at three of these sites have since died off. And then lastly, we have our fish. So there's the pallid sturgeon, just like the lake sturgeon. Um, and then there's the Topeka shine which populations of the Topeka shiners has declined by 70% across the range over the past half century. Population declines are mainly due to three things, habitat loss, increased sediment in small streams and creeks and streams or creeks and reduced water quality. Likely, uh, another likely source of population decline is the creation of dams and impoundments on small streams. Often these man-made ponds were stocked by large predatory fish, which prey upon many small shiner and dace species, including the Topeka shiner. And then the sickle fin chub and the sturgeon chub um, were petitioned for listening, listing on the endangered species list in 1994. However, the population studies were, were um, after population studies, it was determined that the sturgeon chub um, population was larger than first believed and was removed from consideration in, in 2001. Because of extensive habitat loss, the surgeon chub has been placed on, on 10 state endangered species lists, including Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, Nebraska, Iowa, Kansas, Illinois, Kentucky, and Tennessee. Although the population is listed as vulnerable in Missouri, it has not been added to the state's endangered species list. In December 2017, the first Fish and Wildlife Service announced plans for status review of the sturgeon chub. This process uh, will include gathering of scientifically accurate information from sources and reviewing this data to determine uh, if listing of species is warranted. And then the last one that we'll be talking about is the black nose shiner. Um, little is known of the population trends of the black nose shiner, and it is believed to be declining in the southern portion of its range, including Nebraska. There are also some strongholds of population, including Michigan, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Canada. And then to finish off, uh, we'll talk about some ways you can help the, some of the endangered species that we talked about. Um, so first and foremost, you want to support or donate to conservation organizations um, like Gimmon Parks and other conservation um, organizations that help nationwide and globally, um, like the World Wildlife Fund, um, to help endangered and threatened species. Um, celebrate Endangered Species Day to raise awareness uh, on the third of, it's gonna be on the third May, third Friday in May every year. And then you're gonna to wanna to help conserve natural resources. So that means using less water, recycling, reducing your waste, um, and just being aware of um, natural resources that you're using. Um, so just like with the wetland destruction and the habitat loss that a lot of these are having um, are often for commercial use. Um, so if you're conserving as many natural resources as you can, that's gonna help out. And then planting a pollinator garden for some of the uh, threatened insects and endangered insects um, just to help um, put the population back up and also a lot of the pollinators could be um, prey for some of the endangered species that we talked about so you want to get the population up for that as well so the ecosystem can be um, balanced again and then um, support local state and national parks um, they do a lot to protect endangered and threatened species. Um, and then educate yourself and others on endangered species. So read books that you um, see about endangered species and tell other people about um, things that you know about endangered species and just spread the word about it and get everybody kind of to do some of these things that um, I just said about conserving their natural resources, planting plants for pollinators, and yeah.
right? And that will be the end of our um, endangered, uh, protected, endangered, and uh, threatened species talk for today.